um, uh, to do this. And I'm going to ask you to begin. If everybody could please, other than the participants, please mute your, um, mute your, um, your devices. That would be really, really useful. OK? And we're ready to go. Chair, would you share Yes, I'm sharing my screen. Give me a second while I put it in presentation mode. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good. I'll go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to the members of the board of directors of Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. For generations, working women across the globe have been held back from progress by a glass ceiling at every stage of their career. Today, we would like to introduce the COVID ceiling that has widened the gender gap in your industry and put you at a critical crossroad that can impact your future for generations to come. We are Carpe Diem Consulting, comprising myself, Hirok, Roshini, Arya, and Shreya, and we thank you for the opportunity to provide you with a solution. Over the course of this presentation, we will be discussing the central mandate for today, analysis of the key issues at hand, the framework used to evaluate the core issue, and a recommendation to help you successfully overcome your challenges. Members of the board, we are at the epicenter of a global crisis that has uprooted the lives of millions across the world and threatening all facets of our society. The impact of this crisis has been particularly felt strongly in global employment with 114 million jobs lost versus 2019. Globally, there's been an increase of 566% in jobs lost and 500% in the unemployment rate. As a crisis, this is worse than the financial meltdown of 2008-9. The impact of COVID-19 has been disproportionate on women. Indeed, between February 2020 to 21, 2.4 million women have left the workforce, bringing the total number down to the lowest in 33 years. COVID-19 has severely widened the gender gap for women in the workforce. This gender gap has been stark in US big tech. Only 25% of GAFM's employees being women, only 3% of tech jobs held by African-American women, and 72% of female tech professionals reported to be struggling with childcare. The evidence is alarming. As of 2018, it was estimated that 202 years would be required to close the economic gender gap. As of 2020, this number has increased to 257 years. This brings us to our problem statement for today. How can US big tech combat the regressive effects of COVID-19 on women and ensure greater organizational representation and retention? The key issues for today can be divided into two categories. What we see on the surface is declining tech labor force participation, leadership representation, and declining equitable pay. But what we don't see due to COVID-19 is poor job support, lack of allyship, limited career advancement, and unconscious bias within the organization. And it is these underlying issues that need to be addressed immediately. Members of the board, we want to make a recommendation to help you successfully overcome these challenges. We recommend that you increase organizational support for women across the talent pipeline during COVID-19 through greater job flexibility, increased allyship, and enhanced leadership mapping. For working mothers, we recommend creating greater job flexibility by redesigning benefits and addressing biases. For women of color, we recommend enhancing allyship through intersectional ERGs or employee resource groups. And for women in leadership, we recommend enhancing leadership mapping by creating efficient leadership networks. I will now hand it over to my colleague Roshini to take you through the analysis. Thank you, Hirak. Here's a question for you. Do you know a role model who is a female in technology, in senior leadership, and is a woman of color? Chances are that you don't. Our next section explains why the situation was already worse for women in technology and how COVID-19 only aggravated it. 
Statistics indicates that progress towards gender equality in the US technology sector had been minimal even before the pandemic. Although women make up 47% of the labor force in the United States, the previous slide please, they represented only a marginal portion of the tech sector. Female representation at the largest tech employers in the United States, the Gaffin Group of Companies, paints a grim picture of the state of women in technology. They are severely underrepresented across the firms as of today. Women make up 39% of global employment, however, accounted for more than half of the overall job losses as of May 2020. COVID-19 has indeed had a major setback on the very little societal progress made by women and has had a disproportionate impact on them. Taking a look at the graph towards the right, charting out the differential rates of unemployment during US recessions for over 70 years explains why this disproportionate impact is also unprecedented. A differential of 2.6 percentage points is the first of many decades for women and even surpasses that of the global financial crisis. The challenges faced by women today are not all identical. Let us focus our attention to the most vulnerable groups. On an average, women are responsible for 75% of unpaid care and domestic work in our homes and communities. A third of single mothers were already living below the poverty line and a million of them now had lost jobs. Women of color were also disproportionately affected as can be clearly seen in the sharp increase of their unemployment rates since the pandemic hit. They were also subjected to the emotional tolls of the difficult events that 2020 brought forward. The situation is not any easier for women in leadership. They're working overtime, facing increased burnout and are constantly under the pressure to perform more than their male counterparts. To add to all of these pro problems, the tech sector is undergoing through uh, uh, transforming with automation, and that poses a greater risk of widening the gender gap through reskilling. Big tech firms are well known for their generous compensation and benefits packages. In fact, all of the players that we looked at just now offer competitive parental leave, childcare coverage, as well as women empowerment programs. However, Considering the situation now, how effective have these programs really been? We wanted to understand why these initiatives didn't really result in expected outcomes. We found out that, firstly, most of these programs were generic in nature. Uh, they failed to account for the individual needs and challenges that were faced by the different intersections of the workforce. Secondly, since each location executed its own initiative, they acted as disconnected units that worked on a local scale thereby failing to leverage the power of an interconnected global network. Thirdly, firms need to go beyond diversity to also ensure inclusion. By fostering a culture that promotes dialogue addresses the distinct challenges faced by different groups of women. Fourthly, most of these firms have limited to no reporting of the outcomes of these initiatives. A lack of reporting trans translates to a lack of accountability and transparency about the effectiveness of these programs. And finally, these initiatives weren't usually tied to management goals. Not having a top-down implementation seems to be uh, providing a leeway for a lack of accountability. The current situation poses a risk of losing critical talent, the impact of which could last for generations to come. Let's have a look at the financial implications. A Washington Post article last year pointed that one of four women who reported becoming unemployed during the pandemic said it was because of lack of childcare, twice the rate among men. Extrapolating data from the US Census Bureau and research from Northeastern University, we find that with 6.5% of working mothers leaving the labor force and 6.5% shifting from a full-time to part-time position, the combined total would be an estimated $90 billion in foregone wages and $17 billion in tax revenues lost annually. Looking at the impact of the pandemic-induced challenges on women's employment, as well as in the US economy, we understand that it can lead to a significant economic impact. Globally, in a gender regressive do-nothing scenario, GDP in 2030 would be one trillion below where it would have been if COVID-19 had had proportionate impact on both the genders. But if action were to be taken now to achieve gender parity, $13 trillion could be added to global GDP by 2030 compared with the gender regressive scenario. For the US specifically, every state and city could add at least 5% to the GDP and half of the US states could add more than 10% to the GDP in just five years time. 
these numbers don't even come close to the economic value of the true equality between men and women, which will net the US economy to 4.3 trillion by 2025. And that is a significant economic opportunity. I now invite my colleague, Arya, to walk us through the legal and ethical implications. Thank you, Roshni. So for our legal analysis, we analyzed laws at both the federal and state level. At the federal level, we looked at the Equal Pay Act, whereas at the state level, we looked at gender and racial diversity bills instituted in both California and Washington, because each of the five players that we've analyzed are headquartered in either of the two states. Now, starting with the Equal Pay Act, the act mandates that employers need to pay equal wages to both men and women when they carry out work that requires equal skill, effort, and responsibility. Employees who believe that they've been discriminated against can sue their employer in court or file a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. However, a quick look at the average salary paid to both men and women of that work in GAFM firms in 2020 revealed that GAFM is far from achieving pay parity. In fact, the only outlier is Adobe, which is clearly leading the pack right now. So we can say with conclusive evidence that COVID-19 will further widen the wage gap due to the higher unemployment rate of women in the past year. Now, moving on to the state bills, both California and Washington have been making strides in furthering the gender parity in their boardrooms over the past years. Now, California's bill requires that at least 50% of its overall board of directors need to comprise of women, whereas Washington has that number at 30%. But a quick look at the current board of directors composition at both these firms show us that GAFM is far from achieving gender parity. AB 979 of uh, California also mandates that 33 percentage of the order of board of directors of firms that are located in California need to comprise of underrepresented minorities. Now, the law classifies anyone that is a person of color or a member of the LGBTQ plus community as an underrepresented minority. Once again, a quick look at the board of directors composition shows that once GAFM players in big tech in California are once again lacking in UN parity. So the gender and racial parity is yet to be attained at the leadership level for GAFM. Now, we can see that there has been a delayed and inadequate adoption of these regulations by GAFM players. While the laws for equity exist, firms are clearly not doing enough. And this forces us to question whether firms are merely checking off a box for the sake of compliance. The answer to which is a resounding yes. Now, moving on to our ethical analysis. GAFM has been receiving a lot of negative press over the past couple of years for their failed diversity. Now, we've identified three personas that have been impacted the most over the past year and who require GAFM's immediate attention. We'll be starting with Feroza, an African-American software engineer who works at Google. We'll then be looking at Emma, a working mother who serves as a senior financial analyst at Amazon. And lastly, we'll be looking at Charlotte, the VP of Partnerships at Facebook. Now, the framework that we've used in addressing the ethical challenges that are faced by each of these personas is firstly determining who has been impacted and understanding what they actually deserve and comparing that with what they receive in reality. Now, starting with Feroza, a woman of color, she requires a work culture that promotes allyship and furthers racial parity. She also requires a firm that is invested in her career advancement. However, she is at the receiving end of a lot of microaggressions and unconscious bias from both her peers and management, which results in her career stagnating. So the racial bias that she faces leads to severe job dissatisfaction and her choosing to exit the workforce. We'll now move on to Emma, a working mother. She requires a culture that is empathetic towards her needs, a flexible work environment, and financial resources needed to support her and her child. However, what she does receive is a lot of negative perceptions from her colleagues about her work and her productivity when she chooses to avail a flexible benefit that is provided by her employer. A lack of timely and affordable daycare services also means that she has to accept a reduction in her working hours to take care of her child, which in turn leads to her accepting a lot of significant pay cuts. So working mothers such as Emma are hence forced to exit the workforce, thereby widening the gender gap that already exists in big tech. And lastly, we'll be looking at Charlotte, a woman leader. Women leaders require a lot of representation at the level in order to help build a network of like-minded individuals. They also require consistent training and development opportunities to further function effectively as a leader. And lastly, they require an open, inclusive, and unbiased culture that furthers their growth. 
However, women leaders are subjected to a lot of mental and emotional challenges due to the gender imbalance at the top, which translates to poor job support because of the constant stereotypes that they are being subjected to. As a result of the burnout and disproportionate pressure that they face, women leaders are forced to exit the, work, the workforce once again. So this brings us to take a look at uh, the ethical factors at play here. GAFM is far from achieving equity or even reducing the gender gap. And so the core ethical question at hand today is, has COVID-19 created a glass ceiling for women? The answer to which once again is a definite yes. I'll now be handing over the presentation to my colleague Shreya, who will be walking you through our recommendation plan. Thank you, Arya. So it is evident from our analysis that the pandemic has disparately affected the three sections of women in your workforce, working mothers, women of color, and women in leadership. It is essential that your organizations provide specific support during this difficult time. And for this, we have developed targeted strategies for each section that provide support across the talent pipeline through job flexibility, allyship, and enhanced leadership mapping. For working mothers, we recommend introducing M2N, or the Motherhood Empowered Network, which is a three-pronged approach to promote flexibility and foster empathy for the working mother. In phase one, we recommend carrying out a feedback survey amongst the working mothers in your workforce to determine how effective your current offerings are, to understand the gaps present in your program, and then further invite suggestions from the mothers on how they would like to address these gaps, and also understand the extent of the unconscious bias that they're facing. In phase two, your firm will then leverage the survey results and take action on the feedback gain to redesign the child care benefits program for working mothers. A few key services that we strongly recommend to be included in the revised plan are a child care information bank with information sources on various child care development needs, tying up with daycare providers to further increase job flexibility and to provide mental health services to address the emotional and mental health challenges that they face. Lastly, your firms need to address the unconscious bias this intersection of the workforce encounters by conducting a biannual mandatory awareness training on unconscious bias, creating discussion forums where working moms can connect with each other and build a network that is catered towards supporting and empowering them by addressing their unique needs and challenges. And lastly, conducting one-on-one -on -one discussions between managers and the working mothers on their teams to address any stigma or hindrances they might be facing with availing these benefits and management needs to reassure them that their performance will be evaluated on the basis of results rather than the hours that they are putting in. Now, this will have an overall positive impact on the mothers in your workforce as they feel more supported, allow them to avail parental benefits without a negative perception and have an improved work-life balance. In turn, this will dramatically reduce the turnover rate for working mothers in your organizations. To implement the M2N program, we recommend starting with an immediate focus on conducting feedback surveys and developing training programs. The gaps understood from these can be used to revamp the childcare benefits. And finally, discussion forums and one-to-one -one discussions need to be regular occurrences with a biannual focus on the one-to-one -one discussions. For cultivating allyship for women of color, we recommend implementing the allyship framework to help foster an inclusive culture. For the first component of the framework, we recommend launching intersectional employee resource groups. Although most of your firms already have ERGs for women in general, having an intersectional ERG helps to address the specific issues of an underrepresented minority. These groups can offer critical support and a safe space that women of color may not receive elsewhere at work. These groups should work to listen deeply to the members it is serving, unite widely to achieve large scale change and act boldly by using their voice and resources to influence people and practices. The second component includes a comprehensive and continuous plan for allyship training, which will provide your employees with resources on becoming a better ally and guide them with real actionable items to becoming an ally. The employees who successfully can complete the training modules and fulfill the internal requirements should be provided with an allyship badge. This will allow employees in need to recognize them as allies to connect with and also encourage more of your employees to become allies. Finally, introducing measurable KPIs and tying them to the performance evaluation of employees, especially for the most senior members of your staff, is key to bringing around a fundamental change. Some of the metrics that can be used to measure this are to provide mentorship to junior underrepresented employees, leadership positions, and participation in diversity initiatives. These initiatives will not only provide support for women of color, but also bring about an inherent cultural change in the long run and help you to attract and retain valuable and diverse talent for your workforce. 
To roll out the allyship framework, we recommend preparing for the launch of the intersectional ERGs and developing the training as first priority, and then launching the ERGs, the training and the KPIs towards the final quarter of 2021. For women in leadership, we recommend creating an efficient leadership support network, which has four essential parts to it. Starting with frequent recognition, we recommend highlighting the achievements of your employees in a monthly achievement spotlight newsletter. Regular access to weekly mental health support is crucial to all employees and especially to women who are on a path of progression as they have to deal with multiple stresses at home and in the workplace. We want to highlight the importance of development and training for women leaders as they often face stagnation on the leadership path due to lack of access to appropriate training. We recommend customizing and collaborating on a comprehensive training module catered to specific leadership roles. Finally, we recommend incentivizing for executive level referrals as women often face a serious lack of sponsorship when it comes to leadership roles. This network will enhance the job motivation for women in your workforce and encourage them to consider leadership roles, help them with career advancement and simultaneously juggle work and personal life. It also reinforces your organization's commitment to female reader, leaders and encourages a long-term culture of gender parity. To implement the leadership support network, we recommend implementing the recognition and support paths as a first priority. The training program needs to be developed collaboratively first and launched along with continuous improvements along the way. The referral program should match your hiring cycle and we recommend conducting it biannually. Overall, our recommendations will ensure long-term benefits for the women in your organization and also positively impact your organization and all of its stakeholders. I will now call on Hirok. Thank you, Shreya. The United Nations tells us that the COVID-19 crisis could set back a generation of women. Members of the board, your action and your choices today will shape tomorrow's future for women in the workforce. Through our recommendations of increased job support, allyship, and leadership development, we firmly believe that you can act as the flag bearers for the advancement of women and transform their futures for the better for decades to come. Thank you for your time today morning. And we would now like to open the floor for questions. Harok, I think you need to close that down so we can see everyone on the screen. Sure, let me do that. Are you, can, are you able to do that? Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for that. Okay, um, Peter, would you like to begin with questions for the for the consultants? Um, sure. So, uh, you, I really really appreciate the the presentation, and uh, I think it brings to light uh, a lot of different aspects that I think our companies collectively have been. Have been struggling with. Did you um, did you find any areas uh, where the the existing programs um, were working well, and uh, uh, areas that uh, essentially could be further built upon? Sure, I can take this question. So, as highlighted in our recommendation plan as well, one of the initiatives that the GAP employers are currently doing is having employee resource groups. And in our analysis of their initiatives and how effective they are, we do realize that there is some kind of efficient, some kind of efficacy with this, uh, with this particular initiative, because yes, it does bring women together and they do get to address the needs and challenges of different groups of women in this group. The only drawback, however, is what we've highlighted of them being generic in nature, so it doesn't address the unique intersections that are present in the workforce, which is something that our recommendation plan and helps address by having intersectional ERGs. So we're building on the idea of an employee resource group, but catering it to different um, intersections of the workforce. I hope that answers your question. Got it, it's fine, no problem. <laughs> okay, Carrie, do you have questions? I do, and I, I want to thank everybody for uh, for your presentation today. Um, a lot of really uh, thought-provoking um, 
statistics and, and data that you presented, um, you know, I think one of the opportunities that uh, I, I think tech organizations have, and I, I do think that, you know, many of them are trying to do more in this area is, you know, to, to create this environment even before you, a, a woman or a person of color gets to the workplace, right? So, you know, you didn't um, mention any opportunities around kind of building up the, the confidence and the opportunities for women before they join the tech companies and before they're into the workplace. Do you, do you have any thoughts or recommendations around, uh, you know, ways to build confidence for, you know, all individuals, you know, whether it be things like our code and, you know, some of the, you know, some of the STEM kind of work that, um, that I know many organizations um, are, are very active uh, in, in pursuing. Just welcome your thoughts on not only once people get to the workplace, but uh, what, what organizations like Gavin can be doing um, ahead of this um, population joining the workforce. Absolutely. Thank you, Carrie, for your question. I'll take that team. So we understand uh, the main issue behind the recommendations that we are looking here is to really address uh, the challenges in the immediate short term as a result of the widening of the gap due to COVID-19. And we understand that this needs to be done primarily because it has to be a top-down effort. The change first and foremost happens, needs to happen internally within the organization. And that can only be achieved if it happens top down from the leadership. So the focus of our recommendations was primary. One of the focuses was to build on the leadership aspect of it. That being said, in the long term, once we have built that level of uh, culture with regards to uh, gender e uh, equality, then we can definitely look at installing recommendations for the workforce entry. So for example, Removing unconscious bias within hiring is something that can be developed over the long term. In the short term, it's the organization culture and leadership attitude that needs to change. Thank you for that. And may I ask one more question that I have? Sure. One, one area that I think that we all need to be aware of as we implement some of these programs is you think about specifically childcare uh, as an area of a particular challenge during the time of COVID. It's also a challenge for many men in the organization um, as well. And so I'm, I'm wondering, would some of these recommendations, especially um, you know, given the situation with COVID, would any of your recommendations just from a standpoint of equity across the organization, um, and childcare is really one that, that comes to my mind, um, would, would that be one that you would consider extending to all employees and not just um, women? I'll take this question. Thank you, Kerry. So when we tried framing our recommendations towards partnerships with daycares, as well as uh, you know, having a child care support or information bank as such, we, we did not just look at these specific groups of women. These are just our personas that we you know, created for explaining it to you, but it would apply to anyone in the organization. Be, it, it could be a disabled employee with some, some sort of a physical challenge or a disability. It, it could be uh, members of the LGBTQ community. It could be uh, you know, uh, of the male gender as well. So uh, all parents across the organization, be they single or married, I think it applies to all of them. Thank you. Okay. Tom, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. I, I actually have, uh, at this point, I have, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is a question and one is a, is a clarification. Uh, the first question that I, that I have is that given this COVID created glass ceiling, if and when COVID is, uh, say, this issue of COVID is resolved, do you expect this glass ceiling to, uh, to continue to exist or the effects of COVID to continue to exist uh, regarding a, uh, a glass ceiling? And I'm, I'm asking that in reference to something that you, uh, you started off when you said that it would take 257 years to close the gender gap. I'm not quite certain how these things uh, are related. Uh, 
that's a great question tom i can take that so in the long term once we do overcome covid the biggest concern for companies in gafam or us big tech indeed is to see the uh, long lasting effects of covid right now the issues of allyship of uh, the lack of job flexibility is something that will continue to exist in the long term a working mother who is already facing issues in covid will only continue to face longer issues when the rush of the work pressure comes back into her life which is why it is crucial to keep a long term vision in mind when building your short term solutions our recommendations today might be short term but their impacts can be felt in the long term long after covid is over and has been dealt with all right thank you All right. So if I if I can ask uh, just uh, one more one more question, uh, you, you stated that uh, women are underrepresented in uh, the tech professions, and and that's uh, been substantiated a, a number of times. What do you think big tech can do to uh, to help in this? I can take that one. Uh, thank you for your question, Tom. So uh, we ha- we had a very deep analysis on this, and we found a lot of numbers that not just GAFM but smaller tech companies are also facing this issue. Now, uh, big tech can be an example for the smaller organizations in that uh, it can show how to uh, achieve this in a practical way and on a larger and on a larger scale, which we can then scale down to smaller companies, and. uh this is an issue that has been prevalent for a very long time and we hope that our recommendation can uh, so- resolve these issues uh not only uh, for big tech but also for some of the smaller companies like i mentioned all right thank you great tim do you have questions for our consultants yes um so um obviously on the surface uh, this is positive and constructive when i really think about the implementation of this past history suggests there might be uh members for example of of you know uh, men um well, let's say white men who will look at your suggestions and think of it as giving special preference you know on the one hand we're all trying to be convinced that you know men and women are equally smart and valuable in the workplace women of color are of equal intellect and value but here it is you're suggesting all these special things uh which will lead to discrimination against you know white males and so have you thought about the manner in which you would implement your recommendation in a way that would minimize the um anger and the negative feelings uh about uh about this uh reverse discrimination that might be felt by white males in the workforce um sure thing i can take that question um brilliant question by the way because this is something that we did come across when we were doing our research as well and to answer your particular concern of how a white male might feel that there's an unfair preference given to women in our recommendation plan i believe that that's why our recommendation plan is so soundly built on the fact of addressing unconscious bias and building a network of allyship because we need to have our male counterparts involved in the whole learning process as well because on the surface everything might seem like it's fine it's dandy men and women are treated equally but when you truly start helping them understand and notice that these are the microaggressions that women face on a daily basis when at the workforce and with respect to even their having their work evaluated and these are the unconscious biases that uh, they tend to be subjected to men would really get a deeper understanding of this is how my women counterpart might be held behind and this is how i can help them move ahead in this particular job in this particular in their particular role as well so addressing that unconscious bias will help them understand that they have an equal part to play in promoting their female counterpart's career and then having the having a lot of unconscious training that addresses it and then building the network of allyship that makes them that gives them a feeling of being invested in their peers career as well so that's how we we plan on fostering 
an environment that is supportive and inclusive and actually improving the condition of women in big tech. Um, that's a great answer. Thank you very Thank you. much. Okay. Uh, one more point. Um, you know, you, uh, Aria, were kind enough to uh, address uh, the ethical facets. You know, I wonder, did you think about how you're defining, you know, what's ethical versus unethical? Like, you know, are there, you know, you, my notes show, you know, that you, you address the concept of, you know, what, yeah. what the woman deserves, you know, yeah. which is great. But I wonder, you know, what, what's at the heart of, of what you consider to be, you know, if something is an ethical issue, why is it an ethical issue versus something that's not? I think that just boils down to just the feeling of being treated equally or fairly. And when you realize that, hey, this doesn't seem right to me, or they seem to be getting something more preferential than I am, or they're just being treated a bit more better than I feel. At the end of the day, it just boils down to how something that's been done to you or said to you makes you feel. And if you feel like that that, that isn't positive or that isn't an ideal way of being treated, I think that's that, that was the core in which um, the team and I, we ended up building out the ethical section. So it's just the concept of being treated fairly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bye. Ruth. Okay. I have only one question and that is about microaggression because I'm an employment lawyer and this has become the catchphrase I would say of 2020, 2021. Um, that I hear all the time, I believe microaggressions have been committed. And then when I ask someone to describe the microaggression, um, that I find that they're not able to do that effectively. You know, and it, it, it just, it boils down to the last words that you said, Aria, fairness. What is fairness? Do we define fairness objectively or subjectively on, based on the hearer or the speaker? So could, could all of you comment on that, please? Sure thing, I don't mind starting that. Um, sure. to, an to answer your question of defining fairness objectively or subjectively, I believe that it is a mixture of both. And to give you an example of just subjectively, for example, one of the issues or one of the microaggressions that women tend to face, especially in the tech sector, is if a female uh, coder were to write a code, you would have someone ask, you would have some, you might have someone that would question the validity of the code or saying how effective is it, how effective the code is going to be. But their male counterpart would not face the same issue. But it isn't even something that the, the, the person who asks the question does it consciously, it's just unconsciously. But you do realize that it is an aggression that the woman does face because her experience or her merit is called into question. So I hope that answers one part of your question. Thank you. You're welcome. Rishini, what do you think to that same point? Yeah, I mean, I came across an interesting uh, example, which I'd like to present here as well. So uh, equity, as you know, we all understand, is not equal to equality. So equality is where, uh, I mean, imagine there's a fence and there are some tall people and there are some short people. Equality is when you give a block to everybody and ask them to go see over the fence. The smallest person will not be able to see it. Equity is where the smallest person gets a taller block to go stand. So it's preferential treatment to go see over the fence. But what we're trying to say is to eliminate the systemic barrier. That is a fence itself. That is a cause of the inequity. And if you remove that altogether, that's when we achieve true equality. Okay. And Shreya, do you have anything yeah. to add to that? Yes, I think I would have to agree with both Arya and Roshni that it is a mix of both subjective and objective. And even when we were evaluating uh, this topic, uh, we came across a lot of instances that it's not just about uh, some of the inherent biases and the stereotypes that we talked about, but since this industry has been around for a very long time, these stereotypes have sort of uh, shown their way to the hiring test or the evaluation parameters. So in some ways, uh, the objective and the subjective have been combined uh, to form a very large ethical and moral issue. And Hirat, anything you want to add to this? Absolutely, Ruth. As a man, I feel one of the biggest issues that men have with gender equality is the fact that they refuse to recognize the inherent lack of uh, equality that exists. 
I think this is the biggest source of the microaggressions that women face every day, which is why this inherent lack of understanding of what equity is within men needs to be addressed immediately. Our recommendations, the biggest feature of them is not that they are limited only to women, but it's important to have men to be a part of the conversation as well and to make them aware of the fact that an inequity exists, it needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed right now. Okay. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Are we I good? I did, I wanted to follow up on a, a so a point that Tom had made uh, to build on that. So thinking about uh, this program that you're proposing and what uh, a post COVID world looks like with regards to the future of remote work and return to work. You know, I, Microsoft and Google are already expressing a commitment to more flexibility and more um, hybrid work models. How do you think this uh, this proposal fits in uh, with uh, whatever your picture of uh, uh, remote uh, work and return to work looks like uh, in the near future? I can take that thing. Roshini, do you want to go? Go ahead, Hira. Okay. Perfect. So right now, the initiatives that have been taken in terms of flexibility, some of them say as permanent uh, work from home, for example, with Twitter, these do address flexibility to some extent. I we agree. But something that these uh, elements do not address in particular is the mental aspect of it. We believe as a company that GAFM and indeed US Big Tech not only needs to provide more job flexibility, but post COVID, when women re-enter the workforce, when the work pressure and the work style that they have been used to over COVID, over a period of greater than one year, when the entire work pressure hits them back again, it's the company's responsibility to provide strong mental health support to make sure that they can efficiently cope with the post COVID world. Okay. Okay. So Thanks. let me, okay. So let me say something. This is one of the finest presentations I have seen in 18 years. It is extraordinary in so many regards. Um, first of all, the four of you work so beautifully together. There is not one person who's the superstar. You are all superstars. You are all exceptional. You presented beautifully. You coordinated beautifully. You are articulate. Um, I wrote down some, um, um, some notes earlier on. Passionate, compelling, organized, clear and convincing. I wanna say beyond a reasonable doubt, frankly, from my profession. Um, um, Harak, you began so powerfully and the image of above and below the surface was tremendously, tremendously powerful, but it wasn't the only one that was like that. All of the slides were fantastic. The ability to see this on the macro level, trillions of dollars, millions of, of people implicated, but then you did something extraordinary. You presented the three case studies of the three women and put it down to the micro level. And there was never a part of this presentation that was weaker than the other parts. You went from strength to strength. That is an exceptional, exceptional presentation. Um, you, um, you, I mean, I thought this had it all, frankly. You, um, you articulated issues in the legal sense, the business sense, very strong on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the quantification here. But then sometimes when people do that and they're great on finance, the ethical kind of doesn't rise to that level. And yet you did that. Um, and you did it beautifully. Another extraordinary thing is that we're always told that we're the board of directors of a company and you're our consultants, right? It's almost hackneyed at a certain point to be put in those roles. You took on something more complicated. You said, we're speaking to a consortium of multiple companies. And you know, that's a risk. That can be more difficult and more complex because every person on the consortium represents a, a different company. Sure, they're all in tech. Sure, they're all high tech. They all have issues in terms of hiring recruit and recruiting women who were in the STEM sciences, but it was, it was universally applicable. 
right? It was not a judgmental presentation. It wasn't, well, you haven't done X, Y, and Z to put us down as leaders in our respective companies and to make us defensive. It was very proactive and, and incredibly, incredibly positive. Um, I thought that, um, you know, as we closed down that initial, the, the, the examples of the three women, and then you moved on to the three sets of recommendations, very specific, detailed, comprehensive. That was just simply outstanding. And then what does Herrick do right afterwards? He pulls it, he goes global on us to the United Nations, okay? And that resonated tremendously with me, again, from the micro down to the, up to the macro level. Um, in the Q&A, you were so smooth, all of you. You knew where to answer, how to answer. Um, you balanced one another um, in a completely beautiful way. And I have to say that when there was a question about what about the applicability of child care and about men, what did you say? You referenced the LGBTQ community and you referenced the disabled. That was, I thought it a very powerful moment, you know, to reflect that this, we're focusing on women for this presentation but we also have to recognize potential other issues and the applicability of awareness and training and mentorship uh, and recognition um, across the board. Uh, that was an incredibly powerful um, 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 item for me. And, um, and also this microaggression thing is not an easy thing to understand. And um, it's funny because I have a client who is the former head of diversity in a major university. And we have been talking about that heavily in the last um, month. I think next year she will probably judge the competition. And you handled, that's a very tricky one, by the way, handled absolutely beautifully. Um, and um, the, the reference to fairness, the difference between equality and equity. Wow, wow. And, and Tim will tell you, I am very, very critical. You know, I think that's why I've been an Uber judge for so many years because I cross-examine people. I almost said no questions, you know, other than that one question. Not only did my colleagues ask you pertinent questions, but frankly, I don't think we had a lot to ask. And that means that the presentation was so good that you left us convinced. And um, you made me feel very empowered if I was a leader in one of these companies that now not only do I understand the issue because I think we're all aware of the issue, it's on the front page of the New York Times today, frankly, about women leaving the workforce that they've been running series about this in the last week. But what you did was you gave us tools to go back to our respective companies to possibly have a consortium of all of us discussing these issues in common. And so you had, you had a, not only a problem, you had a vision and you had a solution. So congratulations. I really applaud the four of you. You're outstanding. I wish you all the best of success in your careers. And I know that you are all going to be incredibly, incredibly successful because if you were this good, this smart, this committed um, at this stage in your lives, um, it's just extraordinary. So congratulations. Thank, Thank, you, so Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Carrie, do you have anything to add to that? Sure, although you certainly summed it up uh, perfectly. Um, I, I just wanna say that I really commend you for taking on this topic because this, this is a topic that a lot of people are very uncomfortable talking about, right? right? So um, so to, to take on this topic and to address it in such a thoughtful and uh, you know, non-threatening way, but in a problem solving way, um, I, I just think that, that you did a phenomenal job on that. And, and frankly, I'd like to ask for a copy of your slides to share with our head of HR. Um, and so uh, if that's something I could um, have the opportunity to do, I, I would like to share that. I mean, we talk about it a lot. We talk about these issues a lot. And, and we do talk about the balance of perspectives about how others in other groups uh, may be feeling as a result of initiatives. And I think what happens in a lot of organizations is that, uh, that, that the organization gets paralyzed because it's, it's a difficult conversation and yet it's such an important one um, to be having in organizations. So I think that um, I commend you for many things that Ruth already said, but I especially wanna add for taking on this particular topic. I, I think that was, that was just really, um, you know, it was a really special thing to do, so thank you. Peter? 
Well, uh, to echo Ruth and Carrie, uh, really fantastic job. Uh, I think from a, you know, starting from the presentation standpoint, you had really good energy together. You used your, your um, materials effectively. I think it, it was very, there was a lot of data there. It was, I think it was very rich and nuanced. And uh, as Carrie mentioned, it would be great to have a copy of this to be able mm -hmm. to think back and to continue to, to pour over. Um, so, and in terms of, you know, you know, addressing the, the financial aspects, the, the legal and ethical aspects, I think you did a wonderful job and, uh, again, uh, really great work in, in dealing with what is a, a very, uh, very tricky issue. And, uh, you know, I think you raised one of the first things that you raised at the beginning was, uh, that that most most of these companies are already trying to do something and ha and have been trying with varying degrees of of success. So uh, so continuing to provide those kinds of examples of okay, well, what else can a company do? Uh, wh what what are they not doing? Uh, that uh, is is a real uh, real opportunity, I think, for for these companies, and I think for. Uh, technology, uh, the, especially uh, people that work in technology and the technology industry in general. So great work. You have a bright future ahead, all of you. Oh my goodness. Tom? Thank you, Peter. Well, one of the, uh, one of the things that I, I found uh, particularly interesting in, uh, in your presentation, which by the way, was an exceptional presentation. And I have to equate this with, the, uh, uh, with my former employer, Hollister Incorporated is that uh, Hollister has for years dealt with the issue of gender, uh, gender inequality. And I think it's, it's done a, a stellar job at, uh, at this, at, at removing uh, glass ceilings. And of course, COVID-19 uh, presents its, uh, its own range of problems. Uh, so uh, if any of you are looking for, uh, for a profession in a uh, medical device manufacturer, uh, I'd be happy to give you a recommendation for them. They're a great company to work for. And I think they address a lot of the issues that, uh, that you brought up. But besides uh, that, uh, I found that, you're, uh, that you were all very articulate. You were very well prepared. Uh, to uh, typify how well prepared you were uh, was your ability to answer uh, answer the questions that were uh, were thrown at you and to immediately answer them. So uh, I mean, this just simply goes to uh, speaks to the level of preparation that you uh, that you did in this. I like the way that you moved in between the macro and and micro levels. I thought that was uh, that was very well done. And as uh, somebody who has worked in data all of their life and has listened to the, uh, to the expert uh, consultants and experts in fields on three different continents uh, and has listened to more than their share of anecdotes, I like the fact that you present data. Uh, there's a, uh, it, in my line of work, there is a, there's an old adage and that is anecdote is not data, and the plural of anecdote is not data. And I like the fact that you that you did present data. That made things much clearer for me. So thank you very much. And Tim? Uh, thank you. Um, let me start off by saying, uh, Peter, I don't think we've ever met. I'm a graduate of San Diego State, so it's a pleasure to see you here. Um, well, uh, Nice job, team. Um, I, I, I do have some constructive criticism because it's just, uh, it's who I am. I, <laughs> you should have been at my wedding 32 years ago when I uh, suggested my wife could have done her self-written vows better, but that was a long time are you ago. Still, are you still married to said wife? Uh, yes, 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 okay. we are, yeah. <laughs> she took um, the suggestion, undoubtedly. So uh, pluses and minuses, um, as Ruth said, um, it, because I'm kind of a technical person, um, uh, I love the slides and, and Carrie said the same thing. Um, I want the deck, but not for wonderful reasons that Carrie did. I just wanna steal your format, the, the thing you have at the bottom and using the key takeaways 
just fantastic. I, I won't give you credit. It's just fantastic. Um, so uh, the clarity of the slides, they, they didn't have too many words. And the balance of our desire to hear your words and really listen to you, uh, but at the same time, let the slides complement that. It was perfect uh, the, because too often the slides are so compelling and you make me want to read them and then I stop listening to you. And that didn't happen this morning, which is really rare. So congratulations on that. Uh, like Ruth said, um, I'm really impressed when the team come, comes across as a real team. Um, and uh, however you did it about sharing the, uh, answering the questions and this and that, I, I really felt like the four of you were a team, which is uh, great. Um, I love passion. Uh, to me, it, it, it makes me feel like you practiced a lot, which we love. We love when your commitment to doing well in the competition means that you're gonna invest time to practice because you didn't need to read the slides so thoroughly that we lost the fact that you actually cared about what you were saying. Or if you don't care, you faked it well, which is a great skill in life. Um, like uh, Ruth said, the specificity, uh, it just, uh, we love it. This is big stuff. and. 25 minutes can feel like it, go, it goes so fast, but this is serious stuff. And we need something to hang our feelings and our opinions on. And when you give us those very specific examples, uh, they're perfect places for us to hang our, our reactions on. Um, the way you customized the state laws to the reality of our five companies and where they're based, brilliant. It means you're not going through the motions. You really stopped and closed your eyes and put yourself in the position of who we are as listeners. And so that was great. Uh, the use of those timelines, again, awesome. Just, I really felt like, you know, I, I like Carrie and, and others, I have been in the room before making presentations to executives exactly the way this is happening. And uh, they love to see timelines like that. You're you're again behaving in a way like, like this was real and you really care about what I as the listener care about. And uh, on the positives, the last thing I agree with Tom about data, um, it's so easy to just think, oh, let's all be ethical and hold each other's hands and sing Kumbaya. So this is awesome that you're working with data. So now this long list of things to rip you to shreds. Um, Let's see, uh, as you could tell from my question, uh, I wish there was more in the presentation uh, about what, what makes something ethical versus unethical. So without a doubt, it's much worse if you talk about Aristotle or you know Kant or something like that, but I want something in there to help me. Now, you, you answered the question excellently when you focused on fairness, that's fine but it would have been a better presentation if that was included uh, in the ethics part. Um, Tom and I agree on the value of data, but uh, my goodness, you were talking about the data of m not only my company, but my competitors sitting next to me. You didn't tell me where you got the data from. So I'm torn because I liked that your slides didn't have too much, but I'm thinking to myself, God, it would have been perfect if there was a little asterisk at the bottom that told me where you got this information, or maybe a slide at the end, and you told me that at the end we'll have one slide with a little bibliography or something, because it's, it's so controversial for you to use data against me, my company. And so before you, when you do that, you better be prepared to tell me where you got the data. Um, I'm a stickler for the number of minutes. And so you came in well, you came in at 22 minutes. You're, you're given 25 to 30. Um, it's okay to do less. I don't like it when people do less, but it, 22 is close enough to 25 that I wouldn't mark you down, except for moments when I felt uh, there were speakers who s sounded rushed. You were speaking too fast uh, and I wouldn't mind that if you had like gone up to 30 minutes and used a great information, but the combination of stopping at 22, but sometimes people feeling rushed and making me as the listener 
feeling like I have to strive to catch up. Um, it could have been better if you had come across a, some of you, not all of you, a little less rushed and come in between 25 and 30. Um, I, I really care about the financial part of it. Uh, so uh, the reality is, is I'm competing against the four people next to me. And so more information about the cost implications of your suggestion. As you heard from my, que uh, my question, um, I think there was room to acknowledge the detractors, you know, the reverse discrimination argument. Uh, I was being honest when I said Harak's answer was very good, but it would have been better if you had acknowledged uh, the reality, you know, just literally come out and say, now we don't want to pretend that, you know, working on these issues won't confront some people who disagree or something like that. Um, and, do, 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 do. Um, oh yeah, the only other thing is, and this gets back to something Peter said, uh, you know, you, <laughs> you were making a presentation that was telling the five of us, we're not doing what we do well. Uh, Peter's first question was, are, is there anything we're doing that's working well? And candidly, I, I was dissatisfied with the answer to his question. And uh, if, if you're going to be attacking you know, the work of the audience you're speaking to, that's okay. But you need to factor that into the way you're presenting. You need to acknowledge the fact that you're saying, hi, my name is, you know, uh, Roshini. I'm here to tell you that you're not doing your jobs as well as you can be. You know, that's hard to, I'm, that's hard to hear. So in your presentation, you, you should somehow acknowledge the fact that you are delivering constructive criticism, but only because you have faith in these uh, individuals listening uh, that they can build on the great work they're already doing along the lines that you're suggesting. Uh, and that's it. I have to say that in, in the regard of this presentation, perhaps I didn't see the, the five companies as being competitors. They're all in the same endeavor. They all have the same concerns. This, um, you know, the constituencies, they're all recruiting um, women, minority, the disabled, uh, LGBTQ. And, and so, you know, it's one avenue in which they can see each other as co-venturers, frankly. And um, there really are consortia like this yes. in Silicon Valley. I, I used to work at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics and yes. you all would be very impressed with the, the these actual five companies do come together and do work on collective product. They have to avoid antitrust issues and everything. But right. the, the reality is, is you would, you would be very impressed with the likelihood that they actually would do this as Ruth just said. Yeah, I'm just gonna add one more piece of input um, as listening to the other feedback because um, you know, I'm guessing that you'll be giving another presentation um, this week. So, you know, one of the questions that we didn't ask or I didn't ask that, that came to me later was, you know, who, who in our organization should be driving this effort? Uh, you know, where, you know, because a lot of this, uh, frankly, will, you know, and I, I said, I, you know, I was going to talk to HR, but I work very closely with HR, right? So I'm risk and compliance, but, you know, it, you know, should it be driven at, at the CEO level? But, you know, honestly, can the CEO really manage that or who is, you know, so if you, continuing with the kind of the practical recommendations on how to implement this, maybe give some thought to, you know, what parts of the organization need to come together to be effective, you know, and that it probably should include engineering, right, or it should include, but, you know, if, if you at least be prepared for some questions on, you know, what, what team should come together to be most effective in driving these initiatives in the organization. Okay. So thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. We hope that, um, are you all graduating from your MBA programs? Yes. yes, yes. Uh, congratulations. Alas, so you will not be back you. next year, but congratulations. Do you have job offers already in hand? Not all of us. Most of not us. all of you. Yeah. Are you not it's in the world. Where are you going to be working, Arya? Um, I'm hoping in Canada, but if US goes, I never know. Okay. 
Well, we wish you great, great success. And we know that you're going to all achieve it. And um, good luck tomorrow in the short um, sections of the competition. Did you do this for a course or did you do this as an extramural activity? The extra. extra. Yeah, we have a case competition program where we actively engage in training as well as with our faculty advisor. So this is part of our participation, extracurricular participation. Uh It's wonderful. Congratulations to all of you. We wish you great success. Thank and you thank so you much. so much for your kind words. We thank really, you. really Aww. do appreciate the feedback. Okay, best of luck. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Congratulations. You. Congratulations. Nice Fantastic. Congratulations. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.